Welcome to Capital Life Church and Merry Christmas to you. And we're going to be looking at uh, today and next Sunday and the following Sunday at the Christ child being born and looking from different angles. And I believe that God wants you to apply this message today directly to your heart. And I'll be speaking on the subject of peace. And before I do that, I want to recognize some special guests that are here today, Pastor Gene Strickland and his wife, Renee. Will you please stand? And we want to honor you, Pastor from Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, you can tell he robbed the cradle in marrying his high school sweetheart, Renee. Uh, Gene and I were on the same floor together at Oral Roberts University. Gene and I have not seen each other for 32 years, and it's their 30th anniversary. Let's show them our love. Congratulations, Steve. We respect all you're doing around the world, crusade evangelism and missions, and, and pray God's blessing upon your church as well. Uh, we are looking in the headlines uh, in the last week to two weeks, and really in the last several months, there's been a great deal of unrest. We see that uh, certainly in Ferguson, Missouri. Ferguson was not a global name until the last few months. Uh, we see that in New York City uh, in the last several days. And the protests that are happening in New York City and in major uh, cities across the United States as we hear the chant, no justice, no peace. It makes me think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement and when he said that the law can keep you from shooting me, the law cannot keep you from hating me. And I believe that as I speak today on the Prince of Peace, and as we hear shouts in regard to peace, and certainly we see in the Middle East the same, the, the, the attempt to rescue one of our journalists that failed just a couple of days ago, all of this and the lack of peace that we see in our world, and it seems to be in contrast to the message of the season, which is all about peace and the coming of peace to earth. And as we see all of this, I think of not only on a global scale and a national scale as we talk about peace, but in regard to our own personal lives, in regard to our own hearts and minds, what over $135 billion is spent on mental health every year. I mean, that blows me away to think of how many dollars are spent on trying to get people to have peace in their hearts and in their minds. And so today, I want you to look with me to Luke, the second chapter, and we'll start in the eighth verse. The Bible uh, speaks of peace in the Old and the New Testaments, and we see that we are to be led by peace. We are to seek peace, and the Bible even says that it's possible I want you to hear this, and I want it to come right to your doorstep. It is possible for you and for me to have perfect peace, to know what it is to have peace, even in the midst of all that we see happening in our world, and even in the midst of what might be happening in your own family, or at your work, or in your roommate situation, or whatever it is that you're facing right now. So let's look at Luke, the second chapter, and this is a familiar a uh, set of verses to us, and uh, some of the most familiar at Christmas time that, that is read around the globe. Uh, listen to this, starting with this eighth verse. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news. They will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor Rest. These heavenly messengers are telling the shepherds that the one who will bring peace on earth 
has been born. And I want you to know that the one who has come to bring peace was born 2,000 years ago, and he is alive, and he is well, and he wants to bring peace in our hearts, and he wants to bring peace to our world. Can I hear an amen? amen. The magazine Personnel Journal did a uh, study, and they discovered that out of the more than 3,540 years of recorded history, only 286 of those years have seen peace. In that time, there have been more than 8,000 peace treaties that have been made and have been broken. And 3,640,000,000 people have died in combat since recorded history. And that can be just a statistic, but that is uh, something that ought to floor us with the idea of how much of a lack of peace we've had in the history of mankind. And then not only is there a lack of peace that we see in our nation and around the globe, but there is a lack of peace, as I have stated, in the hearts and minds of mankind. And you may have come this morning and you may feel that troubling sense inside of you where if you could have peace, that would be the greatest desire of your heart and I want you to know you can have peace this morning. Uh, there was an interview that was done, and I've referred to it from time to time because I was so amazed by the interview. It was an interview with the uh, movie star uh, Harrison Ford. And as some of you know that are Star Wars fans, uh, they are filming another Star Wars. Now, not all of you can say this, but I know Gene Strickland and I can, and that is that we can remember back to a day when uh, the original Star Wars came out, and there was a long line of people. And what I remember about that original uh, Star Wars is that when they showed commercials about it, all they showed was a black screen, and you would see the word Star Wars on it, and that it was coming to theaters. So it piqued our uh, imagination and our interest. We did not see the characters uh, on the screen, on our television screens. What we had to do is go and see the movie, and the first time of seeing the movie is the first time you're seeing all of these characters. Now... You watch those movies again, and it's not as awe-inspiring. But back then, it was. Now we have high-tech stuff that makes things even more inspiring than that. But Harrison Ford's movies have grossed almost $3.5 billion. I think he's number three on the list of the actors who have been in movies that have grossed the most uh, money. And Harrison Ford was in an interview, and... Uh, the one interviewing uh, said to him, I mean, here he is, handsome actor, beautiful uh, wife, and, and all this money. And the interviewer said, Mr. Ford, is there anything that you want that you don't have? And Harrison Ford looked at the interviewer, and he said, well, you always want what you ain't got. And the interviewer said, well, Mr. Ford, what ain't you got? And Harrison Ford said, peace, I don't have peace. Now, to have all of the trappings that one would say are the trappings of success and to be vulnerable and honest enough at that moment to say, I don't have peace, I wonder if you would be that honest to say that perhaps this morning you don't know perfect peace. Or perhaps when you look at your family, you would say, I don't see peace in the dynamic of my family. And I'm about to go back to be with my family, and, uh, or they're coming to be with me out here, and we're all going to get together. And I would say, uh, maybe dysfunction would be more the word to use than peace. Maybe some people don't speak to each other. Whatever it may be. And into all of this comes a Christ child who is the Prince of Peace, peace on earth, and he's come to bring peace. That needs to be tangible to us. It's not just a Hallmark card feeling. You can know peace. You can have perfect peace, and your family can know that peace as well. And in this Christmas season, it seems maybe as we look at all the headlines and everything around us, that it's wrapped in everything but peace. Now, there's a, uh, something that was written by an individual based on the 23rd Psalm, 
and he wrote this, and uh, he entitled it, The Lord is My Pace Setter. I can tell you that my grandmother had a pacemaker, and back then, in order for her heart to uh, beat at the proper rate so it wouldn't speed up or, or stop, uh, this, this pacemaker uh, was placed in. She lived an extra decade because that pacemaker was placed inside of her. I could have made this an illustrated sermon. I could have brought the pacemaker. I have her first one. And <laughs> uh, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't have the second one. But, but technology has now made these out to be like the size of a nickel. And it does the same thing. But I have this big thing that looks almost like a mechanical heart type of a deal. The Lord is my pace setter. I shall not rush. He makes me stop and rest for quiet intervals. He provides me with images of stillness, which restore my serenity. He leads me in ways of efficiency through calmness of mind, and his guidance is peace. Even though I have a great many things to accomplish each day, I will not fret. For his presence is here. His timelessness, his all importance will keep me in balance. He prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of my activity by anointing my head with his oils of tranquility. My cup of joyous energy overflows. Surely harmony and effectiveness shall be the fruit of my hours, for I shall walk in the peace of the Lord and dwell in his house forever. I thought that was interesting that he would base that on the 23rd Psalm and speak into regard to the realities of his life. We need to see that Jesus has come to bring us peace. Now, there's a true story that happened in uh, the United States of America, and it happened at the time of Christmas. And because it happened at the time of Christmas, and as you'll see as I share this story with you, uh, it's very clear that while people are putting out their trees and decorating them, and as, as people are singing the wonderful Christmas songs that we sing about the gospel, at the, at the same time as that, there was something that was happening that was anything but peace, and that maybe others did not notice. Again, true story. A decade ago, at Christmas, Donna McGee received for Christmas a police scanner. It was a surprise gift from her husband, Gary. And she said, they're popular in our neighborhood here in Memphis. People like to listen to police calls. And sometimes a scanner will even pick up the president talking on Air Force One. One day... (laughs) I want better security than that for the president. Okay, one day, Donna picked up on a call between a man and a woman on her police scanner. And the man said these words, are you sure you want to go through with this? And the woman said, yes. Do you love me enough to kill for me? And the man said, yes. The conversation lasted for some 45 minutes, and horrified, Donna listened as the two conspired to murder Kenny, the woman's husband, for insurance money. They were going to make it look like a break-in, and then they were going to escape in the green van, and they shared details about bank accounts, and Donna's 16-year-old daughter, Stephanie, started listening with her mom to the scanner And as she was listening, she heard, along with her mom, that the date of the crime was to be December 30. And suddenly, a young girl's voice could be heard on the scanner, and the lady that was talking to the man on the scanner snapped, get out of the room, Angela. And Stephanie said to her mom that she knew a girl named Angela, and she knew that they had a green van, and they lived just four doors away from them. They realized the woman on the phone was their neighbor, Jacqueline Lee Green, and the intended victim, her husband, Kenny. And they went to the sheriff's office, and the sergeant, Mike Shelby, said, it's the most bizarre tale that he's heard in 23 years of being on the force. The police investigated, and later that day, Green, age 33, and her boyfriend, Christopher Scott Davis, age 21, were arrested and charged with planning the murder of her husband. 
Now, all of that at the time when we're talking about a babe being born and being there in a manger. And all of this speaking of a time of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And yet there's that contrasting sense of two worlds that are colliding. Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. I believe there's no one else in the Old Testament who so clearly foresaw Jesus as Isaiah. And we don't know a great deal about Isaiah. We do know, however, that he, he left a, a profound impact upon the world by the things that he stated and that he was prophetic, that he prophesied this Messiah was coming. And in Isaiah seven fourteen, he tells us that a son will be born of a virgin. And so we know that, that this is going to be a miraculous birth. It won't be like the normal birthing situation. She will be a virgin and will bring forth a son. And in Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, the Bible says, uh, the prophet uh, Isaiah says, Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. uh, uh, Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So Isaiah the prophet is wanting us to know that the one that is coming will perform miracles. Now, I want you to hear that because I believe that this whole concept of the babe in a manger can become this sweet moment of, you know, a little nativity scene that we see here and there where they're, you know, allowed and maybe not so much in public locations anymore. And, and we just get to the place where we, we look and we see this sweet scene. But I want you to know that the prophet was prophesying that the one that would come would do the miraculous. He would perform miracles. He still does. And he can perform the miracle of bringing peace into your family. And he can perform the miracle of bringing, against all odds, peace to you with everything that you're facing and every reason and every excuse not to have peace. The Prince of Peace has come. And he wants to know if there's room in the inn of your heart. And he wants to give you perfect peace. And so Isaiah wanted us to know he's not just a baby being born. He's a miracle working God that is coming. In Isaiah 49, 6, this coming king will be, the Bible says, a light for the Gentiles. He will bring salvation, salvation that will come to the ends of the earth. And that matters to me. Because if the Savior did not open the gates for non-Jews to be saved, then I would be lost so would most of you. But this one that will come will bring salvation to the uttermost, Jew and Gentile. All who would come to him with humble heart will be received. And in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, we see what is perhaps the most familiar Old Testament scripture about the Christ child. For to us a child is born, To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Again, the last part of the sixth verse, he will be called the Prince of Peace. And in this season, in the midst of talking about Jesus being born, please do not miss out on the fact that out of what Isaiah wanted us to understand, Out of this introduction, he made certain, he was proactive, he was intentional to say this one that is coming will be the prince of peace. And so if we are walking through this season and we are not walking in perfect peace, we're missing out on the very thing that Jesus came to give. In fact, I'll put it this far. I'll state it this way. 
Jesus died on the cross so that you could have peace in the arenas of your life where you are lacking peace. He died on the cross for us to have peace. That's how vital this peace is. That's why 135 billion plus is being spent on mental disorders and all the mental care. He has come to bring you peace. And I can say that emotional exhaustion is greater than physical exhaustion. You know what I'm talking about. You can, you can play a football game you won't be as exhausted as the emotional exhaustion that you face at times with things that you're going through. But this Christ child has come with great glad tidings to say, I bring you peace. I bring it to you in the now. And you can experience that peace and you can know it. And Isaiah in the 11th chapter, in the first 10 verses, we see the prophet speaking. Listen to this. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Who's the Bible talking about? Who, who's, his pro, who, who is Isaiah prophesying about? It's the Messiah. It's Jesus. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Now again, what you're about to read or listen to right now will sound bizarre unless we get a sense for the understanding of it. Listen to this. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be Glorious. Now, I want to look at this again for a moment and just focus in on a few things because what we just read is likely something you skip over pretty quick when you're trying to read from Genesis to Revelation. Hello, Mark. How are you? It's good to see you. Uh, I haven't seen Mark for a while. Went out to California. He was doing some surfing. Okay, back to the message. <laughs> Within these 10 verses is something that I think a lot of people would just skip over because it's like, I don't know, you know, ox and I just don't get it all and I'll just skip it. But let's start first with the concept that's given in that first verse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, I wonder why it doesn't say of the branch of David. Because David is the one that was the greatest king of Israel. He's the known entity. Everybody wants to be known as uh, coming down out of the lineage of David. I mean, Jesse's his father, but, but it's all about David. And I wonder if the prophet wants to go even a step before what you would think he'd go to. That he's wanting you not so much to think of David as to think of roots. To think of the fact that this that we're talking about goes all the way back to a root system that precedes even your great patriarch, David. And that peace goes back to Jesus who lived even before 
Bethlehem, for he is God and has no beginning and no end. Now, why does that matter? Because I want you to know whatever you're facing in the now, it may have a stem on it that goes back. It may have a stem that goes back to a generation ago or two generations. It may be that you're troubled by something that you think stands alone in your life and it's just your story, but it was your great-great-grandfather's story too or your great-great-great-grandmother's story too because blessings and curse, they can go generation to generation. But going back all the way to David and let's even go further and say, hey, this precedes David This goes to his root system. I want you to know that not only the trouble that we see, there can be those things that can hang on in families and be curses and generational deals, but also the hope. The hope that we see that goes all the way back. The prophet is wanting us to know that this goes back so far and has a beginning beyond what you could even imagine. It goes to the shoot that will come up from seed. In other words, it's by my plan. I could have done it long, 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 long before that. I brought you peace. And I want you to know what you're facing right now may have its roots going back. But I bring you peace. And Then we look at this and we see that there's something else that's taking place in this sixth verse. We see that all these animals are being discussed and even a viper and all of this. And the prophet is trying to tell us that there, will, there, is, there are fundamental changes that are coming. And 600 years after these words will come a child that even Herod will do his best to wipe out before his life can come to fruition. And Caesar Augustus, coming from the root word agur, coming from an understanding that he's more than a king, he's a spiritual god to the people, and he's polling, he's doing this poll tax so he can get money, so he can live in opulence and have all the money, and he's, and he's causing a burden to be on the back of the people. And in all of this comes hope, comes peace. And the worlds collide. And the poet sat down and wrote about it. And we sing it in a song every, every Christmas season. It's about Bethlehem. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. What was he saying? It's a collision of worlds. And Jesus comes to tell you, don't be overtaken by the burdens of this world. Don't believe that the one authoring Your now and your future is this world and the spirit of this world. He's come to bring us peace. We're to look, as we look at the scripture, and we're to see that these fundamental changes that are taking place that are being brought is to say that it's going to go beyond your expectations. And it's going to go beyond the facts as you think you know them. And that Jesus, the Christ child, can bring peace even when you have every fact lined up for why there isn't peace. He comes to show you things where a lion lays down with a lamb and it doesn't make sense. Have you ever been at the spot in life where you have faced something and everything ought to be tearing you down and depressing you and smashing you to the ground, and yet inside there's such hope and there's such joy. And I know I've been there. I've been there at times where, where I feel everything is against me and I see no light at the end of the tunnel. And then all of a sudden I'll say to my wife, Lisa, I don't know why I feel so good. I shouldn't. Doesn't make sense in the natural. I feel so on top of the world. I feel great. And yet nothing in the facts that I have before me say I should. And it's at those moments that my wife Lisa and I look at each other and say, somebody's praying. Somebody's praying. They may not even know what we're going through. Somebody's praying. That's the peace that passes all understanding. If the only peace that you experience is what you feel you can understand by the facts that you're facing, you don't have the peace that passes all understanding. There are moments in which that peace that just resides within you comes in the midst of the storm. This is an understanding of peace 
When you look at the definition in Webster's or the other dictionaries, you'll see that it says that the peace is, it, peace is the absence of war, the absence of conflict. I disagree. The biblical form of peace is to have the confidence that God is on the scene and you have overwhelming peace in the midst of the war and the conflict. It may not subside immediately. You may be walking through it right now. It may be all over your family when you get together for family uh, dinner at Christmas time and you're opening presents. It may be conflict. It may be dysfunction. But I want you to know that Jesus has come so that you and your family and your colleagues and your friends and your relationships and so that this world can know peace that passes all understanding. And then the Bible says that in the sixth verse, in the second part, and a little child will lead them. Just a baby. Baby, there's nothing more peaceful, I guess, than that. It's just a little child shall lead them. But in looking at this, we see that the angels are telling the shepherds, the angel is telling the shepherds that they're being introduced to a baby, but this baby is going to be their answer to all that they're facing and to expect peace to come through this child. And in verse 10, I love this, what the prophet says, and his resting place will be glorious. Oh, I like that. Because it's hard in this world in which everything's demanded of us and we demand things of ourselves to have a place that is glorious rest, filled with glory, joy unspeakable and filled with glory and the peace that passes all understanding. That's your inheritance. And that's what I want for you in this season. And I want you to grab it. It's a powerful metaphor to those in the days of the prophet Isaiah because they were nomadic people. They were constantly ever wandering. They were on the move all the time. The idea of glorious peace, oh, would that mean something to them? And in this busy and confused and temperamental world, isn't it nice to know that you have a place to go where you can experience perfect peace? Perfect peace.